provide input to the board on items that are before us to vote. Speakers must be district residents and sign in. Because this is a business meeting, there will not be a response period for superintendent or board members. We ask that all comments be addressed to the board and not to the audience. And we also ask that you uh, refrain from offensive language. Thank you. Our first speaker is Maria Hall. Individual acts of racism can occur anywhere, and they do occur from time to time in Southern Lehigh. But does it mean that Southern Lehigh is a racist community, nor does it mean that there is systemic racism in our schools? This is a key concept and an important difference. To believe that there is systemic racism in our district that needs to be addressed through training and other actions is to believe that our teachers and administration have created and maintained a racially hostile, discriminatory environment for our students. Does anyone actually believe this? Is this what our board believes? Is that why our board has approved training on systemic racism for our teachers and staff under the DEI proposal by Dr. Joseph Allen, which is itself based on critical race theory? Mrs. Edison keeps stating that the DEI proposal is not critical race theory. However, when I respectfully ask for the board to provide the community with a complete copy of the training material that will be used to train the staff under this proposal so we can confirm for ourselves that the purpose of this training is entirely race neutral, it was not provided to us. It appears that not even our board members have had the opportunity to review the training materials. How then can the board know that the materials aren't racially divisive if they haven't been reviewed by the board itself? From both of my daughters, now 11th grade and 8th grade experiences at Southern Lehigh, which started at Hopewell in kindergarten, and from my husband and my experiences, all of the Southern Lehigh teachers, coaches, principals, librarians, cafeteria employees, and all the other staff have been absolutely wonderful and amazing, and never once have any of us heard them be anything but accepting and supportive with respect to the race of our students. I feel that Mrs. Evanson has undermined all our Southern Lehigh teachers and staff by suggesting that they need the type of training that Dr. Allen would provide. I respectfully again request that the school board, the superintendent, and the interim super superintendent move to terminate the Dr. Allen proposal and immediately cease all activity associated with the proposal. If any training is to be done, it should be training that focuses on our common humanity so that when we see someone who looks on the surface different than we do, that we immediately remember that we all share the same divine spark and then treat each other accordingly. We can do this without dividing our staff or students by race, without teaching them that our schools and our country are irredeemably racist, and that some of them are oppressors and some are oppressed just because of DNA. I would also like to take this time to say a huge thank you to the Southern Lehigh teachers, Mrs. Boucher, Mrs. Hagee, Mr. West, Mr. Marchek, and all of the teachers, all the coaches. Some of these teachers are also coaches. All of the principals, librarians, cafeteria employees, librarians such as Mrs. Chavon, and all of the librarians and Southern High staff for the tremendous work that you did for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's all we have for this morning. Um, I'm moving on. A motion to approve the minutes of May 24th. Can I have a motion, please? Is there a motion? Thank you. Um, any questions or comments on the motion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? Thank you. Um, on to the superintendent report. Dr. Everson. Thank you. Um, just a quick update on the diversity equity work. Um, we had talked last time about the, the, the survey data having been, the survey being closed, data being returned. So um, just as an update, the report is due from Dr. Allen by June 30th. That will be shared with the board and administration by June 30th. Um, and then reviewed and discussed, presented at a future board meeting in August. Um, so that then the determination could be made about next step. So that's where we are in the process at this stage. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, and because we did mention this during the workshop, I think it's important um, since that is not generally well attended by the public or the community. Um, just 
if you could reiterate a bit about all that has been initiated and all that will be completed at this time by Dr. Joseph Alvin is the needs assessment, which will be presented to us on June the 30th uh, with respect to the data, and then we will decide and we potentially will have him attend a meeting in August he's prepared to attend and discuss next steps that he suggests with us. The professional development plan that was online that we approved is a general framework. We have not approved any professional development plan. The modules that are listed are his framework. They are not approved for use in Southern Utah. So the, the modules that appear, as we said, the, the goal was to complete a needs assessment and for the district then to embark on action plan based on the needs assessment. The modules contained are a framework that are based on the work typically done, the professional development modules that would typically be used in a majority of districts. However, as they state, they are completely customizable, can be changed, can be adapted, and of course that decision has to be made based on the data that is returned. So when you get the needs assessment, you will see any areas of strength in the district, you'll see if there are any areas of concern. Based on that, the module layout will be reviewed as it says to determine whether those four modules or how it makes sense to proceed given the data received or whether the data is leading you towards different modules, more focus on one module, less focus on another. Um, that is all part of that needs assessment and then the action planning process. So your first step in the action plan is to go through and decide what professional development is needed based on the data. Okay, um, moving on, we have several uh, health and safety updates that Mr. Ruth is going to walk us through, um, beginning with our COVID case data for the state. All right, the first thing we're going to discuss is just a review in January. I did uh, do an update for the uh, COVID case for the district at that time. So this will just, and I didn't explain that I would do a, uh, I would do an update at the end of the school year. All right, so uh, to date, we have 241 cases of COVID reported for the school year that broke down to 80% of students and 20% of the staff. You can see a building by building breakdown here. Um, and that obviously trends along the older student population or the larger buildings have more cases. Um, we have not had a case since May 18th that was reported to the district. And the one plus three you can see generally as you can see the attached uh, or the attached uh, graphs mimic the regional trends that, that the area experienced. Um, there's a month by month breakdown by building, which is readily available on the school district website as well. We also have here just a basic idea that the majority of these cases, as was reported in January, were reported directly to the school district nursing staff from district families. Uh, there were very few of a few cases where the Department of Health was the initial reporting. Um, again, the overwhelming majority of these cases were traced back to interactions occurring outside of school, uh, whether the, you know, those are household transmission cases, community events, things along those lines. I did want to include in here of the 241 cases, 117 resulted in zero close contacts being identified, 109 resulted in between one and nine close contacts, and then 15 cases resulted in more than 10 close contacts. So the overwhelming majority had less than 10 individuals identified as close contacts within that cluster. Then there's just a thing that varies a litany of different graphs uh, breaking that information down. The last piece of information here is really just an update in terms of the vaccine. Same thing in January, we did a conversation about this, uh, just so individuals, so obviously the vaccine is currently uh, available to individuals 12 plus. I do have updated data here um, concerning individuals within the PA Department of Health reporting uh, groups uh, for Lehigh County to outline how many individuals uh, within Lehigh County of the 12 plus age group are currently partially or fully vaccinated. Um, but just from a long-term planning perspective, you know, there is no clear idea of if and when 
one thing I said there, it, it, it's likely the most recent data right now is that there was an FDA panel where they actually discussed the validity of providing an emergency use authorization to people under the age of, of, of 12, and there was not um, consensus amongst the FDA panel that they should even be doing that. So um, this is actually more up in the air than, than it has been in a long time in terms of the access for people under the age of 12. This is just a graph for Lehigh County in terms of Lehigh County has, is, is the fourth highest county in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for residents of fully vaccinated um, and as a percent of residents. And then the last piece, just an update, I wanted to provide a real thanks to the nursing staff. We did complete an on-site vaccine clinic um, on May 15th and June 5th. Uh, partnered with the pharmacy at Cooper's Old Giant, and just under 300 people participated in that component. Uh, on the first dose, we had a number of people going directly to Giant, but the second dose was the second day did not work. Uh, the nursing team did a fantastic job supporting that. Uh, we also partnered with Denver Sauk Township Police for the use of their digital light board for that direction. Um, but this time, because of the availability in the county or in the county and the region of local health networks and pharmacies, we do not have a plan for additional um, clinics at this time. Any questions about this information? The next piece out here is an update to the athletic health and safety plan, which is attached to there. Uh, just a couple of uh, updates uh, that, that are significant differences from the previous. Um, we will obviously be stopping some certain components that were in the previously existing athletic health and safety plans. Uh, one of the primary examples being, um, and this has already been ongoing, exterior uh, masking and outdoors um, that has been no longer the case. There also won't be pen checking or things like that under previous iterations of the health and safety plan. At this point, uh, we, you know, per the recommendation of our conversation with St. Luke's, we still have been asking the water is obviously still effective until either June 28th or until we stay getting to a 70% adult vaccination rate. Um, indoor athletics will still maintain back uh, masking um, until additional determination is made. Any other questions? I mean, the majority of this is a much more um, reduced document than was previously. I have a question. Yes. Um, I just, I noticed, um, so I understand that right now we don't have any new guidance with respect to um, indoor masking, right, for, for both students as well as athletes. Is that correct? Well, what the, the final presentation I'm going to have is on the requirements of the American Rescue Plan uh, or the $1.9 million of federal stimulus money that has been funneled towards schools. One of the requirements within the American Rescue Plan is that school districts or you know, local education authorities maintain an updated health and safety plan um, as a component of that law. And when I get into that presentation, one of the components in there is that there needs to be a consideration for universal masking per the CDC guidance, not the Pennsylvania Department of Health guidance. Now what that means in terms of the LEA's decision on that and how the LEA interprets that is really up for discussion. Pennsylvania Department of Education just released this information per the Israel American Rescue Plan on uh, Friday, June 4th, uh, with the template information on that. So I will speak a little bit more to what the requirements are within the American Rescue Plan, uh, or I should say to access the federal funds that are tied to the American Rescue Plan, which is $1.7 million, possibly $1.9 million. I guess, I guess the reason I was asking is um, partially because I, I did notice in these safety plan that it would allow for coaches who were vaccinated to remove masks, not yes. wear them. Um, so I, I guess one question I would have, and, and potentially you're going to amend this in the future because there's Correct. more coming, because, you know, as you, continuing through the um, update, it did indicate a difference between, um, you know, what to do in the setting of a COVID exposure for those that are vaccinated Since we're making some distinctions based on vaccination, I, I do feel that since we are going to have a pretty big student population that is going to be participating in athletics that has the potential to be vaccinated, the secondary, that that's something we need to consider because that's, you know, given what the CDC has said about vaccination, that was one of the potential benefits um, to, our, to our community, right? We have a high vaccination. 
application for it. Um, even for the for our own back, you know, the flip side of that, right? The higher the vaccination rate in the community. So I just this is something we want to add. Absolutely. I mean I'm going to go say to the to be very clear, uh, there is no requirement for the board. We just do this as a as a provide guidelines for the school year or for the summer months there's one of the four practice uh, there is no mention of this so the document generally speaking that we would complete for the american rescue plan could potentially trump this document and this time is not required at this point okay. yeah because i was a little confused because i saw that in our presentation too so yeah. it's going to work for it's going to have a lot more community input it looks like too correct and the final uh, health and safety plan has to be submitted to PD by july 30th that would get into the uh, e-grant system which is associated with the Indian Rescue Plan documents. Uh, just a follow up, I had, I had similar questions. Um, why is there a distinction between, between among anyone that's vaccinated? At this point, the decision was made because of several factors. Uh, some of those factors are that one, the school districts and local education authorities in Iowa, Pennsylvania can't even up their own criteria. Uh, the second was we have uh, in the past, during our past planning process, essentially looked at the idea that children be collecting vaccination data on individual students, and we have not collected we have to collect the vaccination data on individual students. But that is the direction that we, we you know, that we should be going in. We can absolutely start doing that. But in terms of this, it's not a required vaccine. Um, so since this is just specific to athletics, and the majority of athletics that occur in the um, summer months are occurring outside, um, that is the direction we want to go. Okay, that, that, yeah, I mean, I, I'm still kind of confused. I mean, I know we, I thought we were following the science, right? Um, so if adults don't need to be better vaccinated, can we move to K-7? And I assume we don't know who all they are, right? Correct. So, and then we don't know all the students either, but yet the adults, and I'm, I'm not against having adults, uh, the adults, we use their face covering, but I'm getting at it. I don't know why you would have a distinction then for students that have been vaccinated. Uh, to Dr. Salim's point, it seems like an incentive uh, to do so. Um, and obviously, CDC guidelines would indicate that that's safe. Sure, we could absolutely change that. Okay. Uh, so, I, to me, um, I think we could, while I understand that things are outside right now, this, I assume, though, it would, um, applies to transportation, all kinds of things that still during the fitness center, things that are still happening uh, inside during the summer. Um, and you know, I, I, I would question why we would, why we simply wouldn't say if you're vaccinated, you don't gotta wear a mask, right? You don't gotta wear a mask right now. I, I don't know where to go. Well, really, you probably wouldn't be able to do it like that, right? You can't force people to tell you one way or the other, so you would have them, it would be an optional situation, right? Meaning people who are unvaccinated should choose to wear a mask but you can't force it without getting the information from them. And I think that was one of the challenges you were alluding to as well. The same thing with adults, right? You can't, because of privacy, you're not, it's not a forced vaccination. No, I know everybody's not vaccinated. My point is, what we could say is, if you are vaccinated, you should have the option not to wear a mask. And isn't that yeah, I mean, that's what I was what the current policy is, for the most part, nationwide? And why wouldn't we follow that? Well, that's, I think, what I was saying, too. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's what, what he's saying. saying is he's, I don't think he's decided one way or the other. I think his hope is getting some more information still. Well, we have decided. And just, we're not passing it. Well, this, we have decided. This is our plan. This is the interim plan per the plan or the requirements of release of last week on Friday. Since we didn't know when those were going to be released, we took each and released them on Friday at 2.30 last week uh, with no prior notice. Um, so this plan was completed and read into the health networks prior to that so that we can talk for this meeting and to be guiding the summer athletic process. Um, so again, as so I when, said, when will can be updated? Can be updated anytime. Without the board knowing about it? Right. From the beginning of the year, we talked about this could be updated. This, this is not necessarily for approval because things change throughout this process. We will not want to wait two weeks to make adjustments um, in any of the procedures. Yeah, I think what this also applies to 
spectators, right? So, well, I guess spectators and someone else. Maybe someone just coming out of the It's not, this is just a practice program for the local Yeah, I mean, my point is this, and most people are right. I mean, that's my point, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, to, to just say, well, there's not much going on, and so we can change it. I mean, yeah, that's not what we did in the fall. I mean, that just seems, you know, I don't know why we just can't. I don't understand, I mean, I don't really understand why I'm wearing a mask, but I'm wearing it because of what you're doing. So I just think that, I just think that this is me leaning forward, right, leaning forward and, and reacting and working on the side I keep it as updated as we can. And as we know, the information is no longer now somewhat obsolete because it can be updated. And I, I think we owe that to our summer athletes um, because it is, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, look, I, I was coaching during this, and, you know, everyone wearing a mask is, it's not good. I mean, you can't, I mean, I think it's good when it's necessary, but I do think it affects your ability to, to coach. I think it affects your ability to communicate between plays among players and as, as a team. And so, I mean, I do think it has real consequences. Is it horrible? No, it's not horrible. But, I mean, if you didn't have to do it, and it could be a better experience for our students and, and our athletes, I just think you got to lean forward. And change. I mean, I, I don't understand what the hesitation is, um, but that's that's my thoughts on it. And I wish we would consider that and move, move more quickly to adopt appropriate uh, standards uh, in, the, in the idea that I think that's best for our student athletes. Thank you. Is there um, a process in place of how we would be able to get information on vaccines, um, whether people are or not or are not vaccinated? Yes, the nurses can look at other students out there in the system or staff member. And that would include the COVID vaccine on there? What was that? It would include the COVID vaccine on, on, the, on the system that I know that they use to look up the, the yes. um, immunization. I think so. Should they be, should they be, should they, be they, they can. I would just, I would just caution sure. again, we're straying out here right. with private health right. information, yeah. and if we start to make decisions for students by grouping them into vaccinated and non-vaccinated, mm -hmm. I think that, that's a, a dangerous slope to go down. People yeah. have the right to choose yeah. I, I don't think that's one or the other, and I would feel a little, I, I would just caution against making vaccination a condition of, of certain things with our students. No, I mean, we're not going to ever do that because I think what Mrs. Desai was getting at too is we had discussed, I think, at some point during pandemic whether or not there would be some way um, for, right. if we for chose, support. if students right. chose, oh, to let, you know, because because if if a student has been vaccinated and they they end up in a in a close contact situation, um, the guidelines are a little bit different. Right. Right. And we've been following that through the process of like sharing. So that's where it becomes beneficial to the student or a, a staff member because what they're in the back, you know, negatively impact their life as much. Um, and, and I think it seems maybe things got a little bit muddled because we're, I mean, I, I think you mentioned that the next part of your presentation is going to help shed light to why we're not, I guess, updating the athletic plan. It's two, two separate things. Gotcha. Okay. If that's the direction we want to take where we go, we should have that as the next one in the program presentation. So, I mean, I guess the yeah. question is we're not updating, just so I understand, the athletic plan because right now for the summer, it doesn't apply because they're all. Well, volleyball, boys volleyball, or girls volleyball, excuse me, would be indoors. Okay. Um, and then later in the day, they play during the month. Because I guess my question to you would be when would there be an impact for, from any changes to this update for our students? Should be as soon as tomorrow. But meaning it will be a, an activity that would actually right, be that relevantly right. changed by. You understand, like most of our activities are outdoors, you were saying, and it's well, different. Anything is training in the fitness center occurs on a daily basis. Okay. 
I don't know if the schedule was approved. Because the CDC really had just said to maintain the masking for the remainder of the current school year, which is now over. Um, they haven't said anything with respect to summer school, and they kind of left it up to. Since May 15th. Right. And so have you gotten any indication from the PDE or DOH as to how they are going to kind of move forward with their recommendations and, and St. Luke's, did they say anything relevant to the CDC guidelines when they were? The PDE update came on June 4th um, that stated that we should be following CDC guidance specific to the American Rescue Plan and provide a template for community health and safety plan to look like. Um, this athletic health and safety plan was shared with St. Luke's and it was approved by the St. Luke's sports medicine team. Um, anyone question as to why they were indoor masking then that, that was part of what and, and LBHN still is recommending indoor masking uh, for their sports athletics. Did they give reasoning on that? Yeah. Did they say um, why? That's what they can you speak into the mic? Sorry, okay. it's like this way and I'm looking at you. Yeah. Um did they say why? It goes back to the Dutch numbers. And LBHN is recommending it for vaccinated and unvaccinated. For indoor athletic activities, yes. Again, please give me a letter. So just as a clarifying question, the reason these changes were suggested and are, are in the plan is because of the information released on June 4th? Two separate documents. To, to, so this is not this is not the, the document for the updated Pennsylvania Department of Education Health and Safety Plan has to be submitted to PDE by June, excuse me, by July 30th. Um, it's a separate component to this, and that is that's only tied to the to the essentially the 1.9 million dollars that the Southern Rest School District is receiving through the American Rescue Plan Pesper Fund. Um, it, the, any health and safety plan that guides school districts for the 21-22 school year will come from that American Rescue Plan guidance. However, since it was just released and the guidance related to that uh, was just released, and coupled out with the fact that the CDC has not changed any recommendations since May 15th, submitting that plan for approval at this point, uh, I don't believe is intelligent because it's likely that CDC is going to update further what those school-based recommendations are between now and then. So essentially, summer is, is in a limbo status. So the current health and safety plan sunsets at the end of the 2021 school year. Then the, this requirement under the rescue plan to have a new health and safety plan is a new thing. Note that was not shared when people were applying for the money, it's, it's new, suddenly you have, you have to have this plan or there's a recommendation. That begins for the 21-22 school year. So the period during the summer is not covered by either end of those plans. One has ended, the other one hasn't started. So you really have you know, an open period over the summer to make decisions without falling under, under either end. The only thing that does is, is athletic because of that plan. So <coughs> Um, but there is there is no health and safety plan governing those summer activities yet. There's a gap in the middle. So if you can answer this, when either the election results in Pennsylvania are certified and the masks go away, or we get to June 28th, what's the intent for the district for the athletes during that period of time? Assume that effectively the mass orders of uh, PDE and the Department of Balance have both said that entities like school districts could, if they choose, extend that further. So, again, that's going to be where we're going to discuss the component of one of the critical components that is clearly outlined in the American Rescue Plan is we should solicit community feedback for what your plan looks like. So, that's one of the components that we will be doing is to solicit community feedback of, of greater detail for that. But effectively, the mass order is over. Um, if you follow the, the, the other piece with the, the case data, the under 12 population generally was a low affected population um, with 
the majority of cases occurring at the intermediate school, which the majority of them are directly correlated back to a parent. Or pretty positive parent. So at what point has a date given the date that the plan needs to be submitted to the rest of the app? At what point are we going to start reaching out for community input? Tomorrow. Yeah. I think it might make sense. I know you have the American Rescue Plan like an agenda item later, but it may make sense to flip to that, have that conversation, um, and then come back to item three at what point to take them. Line up a little easier. Yep. So just as a uh, rehash to this component, so there are three different financial impacts that came out of uh, the COVID component. So extra one, extra two, the American Rescue Plan, most most recent coming from March. One. Again, these are based on the proportionate share of the Title I program from 2019. Wide range for a lot of activities. Um, previously, I shared with this group what the funding looked like for some of the Lehigh. That's a one for the $15,000 and $4,711 for the Lehigh Public Schools. $958,535 in SR2 and then $1.9 million in the American Rescue. So we're looking at this on June 4th, PTE released a message about this, an updated guidance, a fact book, um, and so on, essentially saying that the information outlines the responsibility that the school districts have with respect to the development of a required health and safety plan for the 21-23 school year. Again, what this means, and again, they label it as safe for trying to impose an instruction on the continuity of services plan. It's really just a health and safety plan. And essentially, is how the LDA will maintain the health and safety of students, education, staff, um, specifically tied to this component. So it can be tailored to each LDA's needs. So for that component, it can be done with that. And that's what PDE is released in terms of masking. Uh, must take into account public comment related to the development of that plan and subsequent revisions. Um, so the plan has to be revised every six months. So there are very specific questions that um, are required within the health and safety plan. So it'll be a dramatically different document. They're outlined here in full as how will the LEA with the race extent practical implement and prevent mitigation policies aligned with the most up to date guidance from the CDC for reopening schools. As I shared, the CDC has been updated the school guidance since May 15th, um, and generally speaking, using the May 15th guidance is not necessarily the best idea, um, you know, unless it's not updated at all. Um, how will the LEA ensure the continuity of services not limited to students with academic needs, students with social emotional mental health? Other needs of those who services. And then we have to, in the health and safety plan, outline each of these bulleted exact, you know, bulleted components of what the school district is doing. And again, this language is taken directly from the PDE document. Um, so essentially, the description of any policy that will, you know, follow safety recreations established by the CDC. Universal correct wearing masks, modifying facilities for physical distancing, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, cleaning, maintaining health facilities. Um, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine, diagnostic and screening testing, effort to provide vaccinations in school communities, uh, appropriate accommodations for children with disabilities, and then coordination of local health and safety measures. So again, this only came out approximately a week ago. Uh, from a local standpoint, you know, the school districts have not come together to discuss this. Um, generally, this has to be publicly available, this plan, on our website as of June 3rd, or July 30th, excuse me. Um, if we don't meet, which we obviously don't have a current schedule for meeting in July, uh, we can submit an unapproved draft version of this uh, into the e-grants, and then we add until September 1 to actually submit the real version of whatever the board approved version would be, and then update that um, component there. So generally, we have to submit this to PDE. We have to upload it directly to the federal e-grant system, and then provide the URL to the web page where the appropriate yeah, it has to be board approved, it has to be in multiple languages, it has to be in your school district, and then you have to provide alternative access to individuals with disabilities. So this also, looking forward, what this means for, for you all, this has to be updated every six months during the period of the ESSA grant, so until the end of 2023. Um, and again, additionally, it should in that in between six month windows, should there be any recommendations or significant changes from the CDC, it also has to be updated and approved through that process as well. Um, but again, this needs to be informed by public uh, and reviewed by the government body. So 
generally my plan for that is a simple so I will present this information tonight. We already created an email where individuals will be able to share concerns. And then we'll also complete a survey, which is also linked on the board docs. Uh, so through the email of the survey, individuals can share a ranked order system of what their preferences are. We would then present a health and safety plan to the board for approval, um, and then submit either a draft or approved version by the July 30th deadline. So it's good that the, the last time the CDC uh, updated the school guidance was in the middle of May, and we, we, we are anticipating additional guidance. Because um, and, and my question, my follow-up question to that is, what happens if the plan that we approve um, ultimately would be in conflict with the CDC guidance? So generally speaking, there is an assumption that they will update guidelines in the interim. Anytime the plan, uh, there are significant updates to the CDC guidelines, you would have to do an update. In terms of, uh, you know, the question being, there are already multiple school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania who have said things that are not in line with the CDC guidelines. Um, Pennsylvania does have the ability that local school districts can operate uh, at their own behest. Uh, in terms of what does it mean for the guidance to not completely align? Uh, there's still some interpretation that needs to be done you know, going through there. Yeah, I guess my question was more specifically to the um, to the era funding and potentially be impacted or if it would be. My assumption, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily have much support in that right now. Yeah, I think part of the challenge with this guidance is that it was it's been received late in terms of the funding was established the program. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they decide that okay, now you have to have a plan. All of this is new information. And when you look at the follow the CDC guidance and you look at that list of things, that is old guidance going back to last year. It is not reflective of the current climate and situation. It's not reflective of current case counts, it's not reflective of the level of vaccination. So it's essentially what they're doing is boxing it into a position and saying, you have to create a plan based on old information because there isn't anything new. So our only kind of, it, 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 the hope is that the CDC adjusts that guidance in time so that it, the plan can mirror the reality as a whole, because as we've shared here many times before, you know, our, our plan and our intention all along was that the full would be a, a pretty regular typical return to school um, based on case counts and numbers and vaccination levels. That, that you know, um, that's where we've always believed we need to be. And then suddenly out of nowhere, it needs now. Of course, the board has another option, which is to say, well, then forget funding. Um, we'll, we don't want the funding if you're going to put that condition on it. Um, but as, as Mr. Dick mentioned, we're talking about you know, 1.9 million. Um, so it, it, the money's now coming with strings on that weren't outlined in the beginning. Um, and until CDC changes their guidance, we're, we're being boxed into a corner of essentially creating the plan. Now, again, some of the language in that, and, and you know, it, it's something you have to review carefully because some of the language is about, you know, documenting how you will consider those recommendations and documenting how you will, you know, so it's the consideration and, and the implementation. Um, there's some, some language there that, that kind of doesn't say implement to the letter exactly as written. So you have to determine at what level. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. The CDC guidance is just this sticking point right now. Hopefully that will change before the plan needs to be implemented. And then so we could also just, and so I see this is two school days, right? So we have a period of limbo um, that will begin once the masking um, mandate is lifted, right, the masking order after June the 28th, right? So we'll have that summer school and summer camps and athletics to deal with. Um, and then we have this piece to basically help dictate how we're gonna address um, the upcoming school year. Um, I, I feel that both we could tackle by utilizing current data Right, we, we do know that case counts are low. We know that vaccination rates in Lehigh County are high, which is good. Um, 
you know, frankly, once you take away masking um, everywhere else, right. it's really not going to be as useful in a school building or in a camp, right? So um, I, I do think we should have something in place for after the June 28th date, you know, and, and realistically, we can monitor it, right? So just like we did all year, we, we, we did well. Um, with respect to transmission, we're not going to have a high attendance, and certainly we can speak to what the summer camp situation is and just and that kind of thing. But the reality is, is that we're returning to normal in all other walks of life and attending events. And if if there's a problem with respect to a variant, which we all know there is one that's starting to get some press, the Delta variant, then we're going to know about it because the community case counts are going to start to go up. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I feel like we probably do need to just come out and decide for something after June 28th. Carry us through the summer because there's a little bit less confusion and wear down. Um, and then work to, toward, you know, what you know, sort of needs to be the info. We can't just move ahead with the second piece, certainly, without getting that, which is it's a requirement. That would just be my suggestion. Well, I agree 100% with Dr. Green. I, I don't, uh, for the same, same reasons I stated in regards to, to uh, the athletics plan, uh, I think it's a district wide plan. I mean, it seems I have, I have a chance to review the documents other than what you just discussed, but it, it sounds to me like they're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not telling you exactly what you're going to need to do. They're not this is what we decided to do, and as long as we've considered it, and there's a reason behind what we're doing, it seems like we'll be in a good place. Um, and again, I, I think it's, to me, it's an important thing. You know, I don't, I don't think it's any small, small thing. Uh, I think it really does continue to affect our students and athletes and our staff. And if we don't have to do it, I think it's a step not to do it. Um, and so I wouldn't do it, especially when there's no science left behind. And like Dr. Bruce you just said, in 14 days, no one's going to be I mean, I mean, no one's going to be required. And uh, other than our local county schools and, and a few other places that decide where the business is, obviously people are committed to require what they want within their, within their organizations. Uh, frankly, I mean, even legally, that might be a problem. But uh, I think we need to lean forward and, and follow the science. And, Right now, that seems to be with the case counts, the vaccination rate in Lake County, uh, guidance from the CDC uh, and from the state all seem to indicate that that's not necessary. Uh, so I think we ought to be clear and following where that leads us, which I think is to find the least restrictive environment uh, going forward. I think that. The challenge, the language, and, and again, there's all of all districts are wrestling with this right now because this, as we said, this is the new. The language in there talks about how the LEA will implement prevention and mitigation policies in line with current CDC guidance. So, so the question becomes, you know, at what point? Again, whenever you're dealing with federal funds, the the you know, the stick that it comes with is if you don't follow what we're telling you, you're not going to get the funding. The language says implement prevention and mitigation strategies. There's no clarity on, you know, the district has to say how they will do that. The question is, if the district response is how we will do that is that we won't, um, is that an acceptable response? You know, you're identifying how you will do it, um, but there's, there's no clarity on what they're expecting that you will follow to the letter. Um, so that's where I think that the, the CDC's current guidance doesn't match with the current situation. So hopefully that will change in the meantime. But, I mean, I tend to agree, and I certainly appreciate what uh, Mr. Benoit and, and Dr. Green are saying. My, oh, my bigger concern is potentially jeopardizing that money because if we put all the plans and the programs in place uh, with that funding, you know, given potentially for another project. Of, of losing the actual plan and implementing that for that support. And so that's really the concern that I have that they're not really 
Do you want us to go back to the PDE uh, emergency special fund template? So the last thing on here is the uh, PDE emergency special fund template, which we discussed at the previous workshop. Um, essentially, this is all here for approval for submission. Uh, and as we discussed at that point, it was really only for two reasons. One, uh, where we would be with the Learning uh, the Smart Academy. As of right now, we have 35 students enrolled in the Spartan Academy, um, including four students who we have enrolled back from cyber charter schools, uh, who have indicated they have an interest in enrolling in that as well. Um, and that is our primary determining factor for the submission of this, is should we have a need to use our own staff, although that is not necessarily where we are at right now, uh, we do have no long-term effect of the various decisions that Uh, most of the 35 students, are they um, grade-wise? Is it it's, mostly high school? Is it what? No, it is, it is a mix K-12. Largely familial, uh, so the last okay. number checked it was... It's okay. I was just you know, curious if, they, if something stood out. In it's the not mind. mostly high school. So are you looking for a vote on this? This would have to be approved, should be using For 4C? Correct. Are you, are, are you, are, are you, 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 Emergency special fund. I have a motion. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This wasn't. This wasn't. This wasn't the today's workshop. Maybe I can say it. Yep. That's all. Yeah. 
So this is the emergency instructional time template, which is essentially give the district flexibility should they be needed to level instruction under the guise of district teachers, and or if there would be an issue again where the level instruction would be for any other reason. Um, oh, no. Right. This is the right. No day conversation yeah. at the last minute. No, no, no. This is separate from the study. So that provides, and I understand the upside to it, um, but I, I am not going to vote for an authorization that would permit uh, the school district to uh, go remote uh, any easier than I, than I, than I would usually allow. It's been a little while since I know it was I heard it, we worked out to go, I understood it, and I understand it, it provides some level of flexibility, I guess. But the reality is, I think you're transferring authority to the superintendent uh, to make those decisions. I thought, um, if I remember right, um, when they're facing an emergency. But the reality of that is, is the ability to go fully remote. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ever vote for that. Um, I, I think. Uh, I think it's more important. I think that those decisions continue to need, need to be made uh, uh, by the board, and I understand the consequences, uh, potentially negative consequences to the district uh, in regards to flexibility. Um, but uh, I, 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 I don't think that's a prudent way to go uh, moving forward. <laughs> To answer your question, currently there is uh, in, in second grade there are six students listed assigned in second grade. That's the largest primary grade. Uh, the total students are all in the remote, um, and you know that's a twenty-seven hundred dollar per head through Spark Academy for primary grade. So we're below what we would have to have a, a benchmark in order to significantly below the use of the high school district. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment that's kind of in response to some of the specifics because I do you know, appreciate that concern. Uh, but what I recall from our prior discussions about that was that, you know, in, in a worst case scenario, if we, without this flexibility, uh, we're not able to, uh, you know, use those instructional days virtually. They would have to be made up at the end of the year in person, which, you know, would be fine. Um, but if we go past, but, you know, in, a, in a true emergency where we have, you know, the potential to go past the end of June, that would be past the contract date, we would then lose those instructional days altogether. So in that kind of a scenario, am I correct that we would not, we, we would potentially lose any form of instruction if we went beyond the June 30th? So there's, there's two pieces. Um, what the, this template um, allows to count remote days as towards the, the requirement for the number of school days. So without this in place, any time that the district, if the district still chose to go remote without this in place, those days, you know, they couldn't because the days would be counted. So those would be days where the students were at home with no instruction, the days would be made up. There's a limit, however, to how far those days can be made up. They have to be made up you can't go into July or August. So again, and, and the hope is that this never, ever, ever happens again. But if you're in a situation again where you have a large number of days remote due to pandemic or you know concerns, um, then you're right. If you hit that June 30th point, you can't make up the rest. And then what, what that does is it reduces funding. So for every day that you don't complete the required number of days, it a reduction in your subsidy per student per day. Um, another question I have is um, LPTI, if, whether or not they have adopted this kind of uh, the, the plan. Because if we um, if we choose not to, and they have, then it would be in conflict potentially with some of the the instructional days. Is that correct? I'm not sure anybody knows. Yeah, they, they, I know they were discussing. I don't know if they voted to approve yet. I don't know. I don't know. Ms. Ms. Gale. I don't know if it's that word, but we have not requested it. So that would be the potential thing for us. We're going to be in a couple days ago, so I'll show you. I guess, isn't there some mechanism that would allow, I mean, just let me ask this question. If you don't adopt this and let's say November of next year, you find yourself. 
itself and the situation where uh, the state is locked down again and it's not up to us whether we can have our schools or not. Uh, with, my understanding is this provides a thought to seek employment. It's not that this is going to be here, so I can seek employment. I don't want the disability to seek employment. And so my, my view would be, or the question would be, would the board be able to meet and, and authorize remote hiring uh, at that point, as opposed to just blanket providing the society now? Without the template in place, without adopting this, the board could not decide mid-year to switch to the remote model and have those days count. So you make the, you make the decision to either approve the template to give you the option or, you, or your set, basically what you're saying if you don't approve is we are going to be just in person and if we have to do any kind of remote, we'll make those days up. This also, to my understanding, covers other potential emergencies. I believe somebody said that uh, the Kennedy system of buildings flooded uh, and they had to shut down for approximately a month. Uh, so I understand that that period is you know, not specific specific to a pandemic shutdown. No, that was the mid day. The, the, we brought up two different sets of So that was the fit application that we previously approved. That was the five extra days. This is only, sorry, this is what you're going No, it's the same, that's the same thing as you would do. You're good, keep going. No this is only for the pandemic. Okay, thank you for clarifying. So what I'm hearing is this would cover if, like Mr. Newman said, if Harrisburg shut us down, and we had no say for a two, any, any period of time, a two week or a three week period, schools that adopt this now would have the option of getting their instructional, some instructional days in. So you just didn't have a three week hiatus in the middle of the year out of our hands and Harrisburg shuts down. This would allow us to provide some sort of instruction and also to not lose funding because we would be going into July and losing any funding of instructional days we couldn't pack into the month of June. Also, what I'm hearing is well, 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 I'm not hearing it, which has just occurred to me is we do not know what the CDC recommendations are going to be, nor what the American Rescue Plan is going to require us to place in our plan that needs to be submitted by July 30th in order to get $2 million of ESSA funding, which we've already accounted for in our budget. So if, for example, the CDC says we have to comply with some sort of closure plan, the American Rescue Plan says that not only Harrisburg now, we might be, you know, kind of handcuffed by their actions. We might also be handcuffed by a, a federal CDC American Rescue Plan compliance, which could also cause us to be shut. So it's, it's those things that we have a window now and we wouldn't have a window in the future if we were shut down. That's what I'm hearing. Is that a correct understanding? That we would not be able to take advantage of instruction for that or potentially as the Pennsylvania State said, you need to adopt the plan or else you aren't able to open. That was this spring. It, it's possible that we might be faced with something like that again. You have to adopt a certain type of plan or else you're not able to function. And if we are not able to function according to that new federal plan, then we would have to either give up $2 million or have this in place or have absolutely no instruction whatsoever. So for that reason, I agree. I think we have all learned that we do a, the, the staff here, the teachers and the staff and the administrators did an excellent job of securing the health of our students. And we are confident in this building that we can pull that off this year and have it be, we've been looking forward to a normal fall. I think we can still pull that off. I think the only thing that could prevent us from that is external forces that would cause us to either choose to forego instruction or give up $2 million or and I'm just not willing to spin the wheel on that right now. I agree. I want this school open and I want kids in it, but that decision might be taken out of our hands or we might be forced to lose $2 million in funding. So for that reason, because this is purely an insurance policy, I, I, if, if I'm understanding that correctly, I think I am what I heard. That, 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 that's just the, the lens through which I'd like to view this. Personally, in fact, how I'm going to view this. Yeah, this gives you an option. It doesn't commit you to anything one way or another. It simply says if for a if there's a pandemic-related closure reason, you can 
you can make that day a remote day and you can count it towards the department of days. That's that's all it does is that any any what any disruption to in person instruction that's pandemic related, wherever that comes from, can be made up remotely. Thank you. Okay, I think has everyone had their questions answered? Uh, can, oh. I mean, I will say this is not really. I mean, this is a problem with the workforce. In my opinion, this is what the problem is with the one percent thing. You know, I mean, this is just commentary. But I mean, think you ask. Uh, you know, I think it's problematic when we are instructed about this. You know, a month. You know, before you vote on it, um, because you know, I, I still don't feel real confident exactly in understanding what it is. And when when you know, if you had had the presentation tonight, and then you ask questions and you better understand it. I think you have a better discussion, and you know better what you're voting on. I really am, am cloudy on what it is. I'm not, I'm not making it up because I don't want to vote for it or not vote against it. I can tell you sitting here right now, I don't recall every bit of And the other thing is when you're not about to make a vote on it and you're just told about it, you know, it, I just think it's problematic uh, because I don't feel real confident in exactly what what the ramifications are for voting yes or no to this. Um, and that's just, so yeah, I do have questions, and, and I don't mean to take everybody's time up, but it's important. It's an important issue um, because the, the, the flip side of what Ms. Gaiman is saying is you are providing authority to go remote, right? I mean that, that is what you're providing, and so then the question is, in my mind, you know, how well can I, as a board, as a person, as a board member, and reflecting the the wishes of the community, help? You know, if if I advocate that ability to have input. Uh, and allow for in the future someone to decide we're going to go remote. I would hope it would all be a good decision. I would hope it would all be, uh, but as we saw in the fall, these are these are very difficult decisions and, and all kinds of fraught with issues. Um, and so I have real concerns about just voting in advance to say, yeah, sure, let's just provide this authority over and, and hopefully it all turns out okay. And so if I don't have to do that, I don't want to do it. Uh, and so I want to understand what the ramifications of me not voting for that is. And it's hard for me to believe that we would have no ability to go remote if we wanted to go remote. But if you're telling me, I mean, is that, is that what you're saying? If I don't vote for this right now, the district has no ability to go remote. Is that, is that, is that, is that? That's, that's our, my understanding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Mr. Rowdy wants to kind of, kind of wait. I mean, the, the current situation is, we are required to document that we meet the required number of school days. There is no provision for, for remote days to be counted. This was an emergency declaration that was created last year uh, because of the pandemic to allow us to have remote instruction. Um, there isn't another method right now to, to allow us to do that. So we, we couldn't not have that in place and decide, oh, tomorrow we're going to be remote and it will count. That was, that's actually um, very accurate. It, it's very similar to the flexible instruction day um, that uh, a lot of districts apply for. Um, and we're able to utilize during this last pandemic um, that some districts who didn't do that were not able to do. Um, unfortunately, there's there's no crystal ball, and, and, and we can't know what, we really just don't know what's going to happen. And this is the state's way of trying to um, provide some assurances that under any circumstances, the educational requirements are going to be met. The current law, as was referred to earlier, is there, there can't be taxes passed in charity. So that's the current law. And that has been in place since, I think, 1929. Um, not likely to change, didn't even change really um, this year. So I think I understand um, your concerns, and I can't tell you how to vote, but I can tell you why this is um, being put on the table now to have to try to get some assurances and some answers, even though there are unknowns. Um, does that make any sense? Does that help? Um, 
and yeah. understand the situation. Yeah, that helps. I mean, it also helps to realize that it wouldn't stop us from going remote. It would stop us from counting remote voting. Right? <laughs> if it's about what counts, it's different than your ability to go remote. But if you can't count the well, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I think, well, I, I think Mr. Abbey would probably agree with this. I don't think, I find it awfully hard to believe that if you were in a lockdown, right, and you couldn't complete your days, um, that that would be counted against you. You could choose to give remote work. I mean, there, you know, there's, right. you can say we're closed, but, you, you know, we're going to provide remote work. The difficulty with that is you would still legally have to make up the days. And so if you do that, you're going to run into teacher contractual issues because they're contracted to work a certain number of days. So they can't teach remotely, um, you know, for, for 30 days and then make up 30 days. That, that wouldn't be an option because you're going to run into contractual issues. And, and then you lose funding as well. We have to pass this one. There is actually no new thing on this. Oh, there we go. Post it as of right now. Okay. So. But we don't have a July board meeting scheduled. Either. No, no. Yeah, but what, I mean. I mean, right. So. I think he's asking about the deadline to have the approved, right? To submit to the state, yeah, correct? So, yeah, why can't we? So, right, we pass this in December if we want to pass it? When, 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 do, we, when, when do we have to pass it? Yeah, currently yeah. just says us, it will begin accepting applications on July 1 is all that is in so, you know, it goes back to my thought is I don't want to do anything until I have to do it. So right now, I have no anticipation that this is necessary. Um, and so I don't want to provide this authority without it being necessary. Um, so if it becomes necessary in October, we can pass it in October. I mean, if that's the law, that's what I prefer to do. As opposed to passing it now, providing an authority that in my mind isn't necessary until it's necessary. Because again, the other side of it is, you can go remote. I mean, it, 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 the problem with it, from my standpoint, is you, know, you can go remote in a way that I wouldn't want to go remote, and I've got no ability to stop going remote because I gave up my authority to do so. Right? So, I mean, that's the downside of it. Uh, and, and we saw very clearly that there was a huge, uh, you know, there, there was through, and I think, good faith differences on this board about whether to go fully remote or not remote, or hybrid or every bit in between and those were all good faith things but the reality was we didn't agree on it and the community didn't agree on it it was a pretty big thing so i don't know why i would go ahead and just i'm sorry but we didn't utilize emergency shifts with the people i believe we voted for this last summer as i recall we, yeah. we, had, we, we, had, we had we had yeah, 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 yeah. real-time shift to it right because we knew that there was a very real possibility that we were going to have to use our vote. Yeah, for some, for some, just to be clear, nothing that happened yeah. actually was the result of oh, voting. Right, of what would be voted. On. I agree, and I didn't want to do it then. And right. why and don't it it didn't happen, after, but you're making a connection that there was an impact from it, and there was an impact. Which is all the more reason not to do it now, right? I mean, if everything turned out just fine without having to evidently or to, or to, or to, to, uh, and again, if we can vote on this whenever we want, what's the Because we have it, we have it as a, as a safety net, so. And a comment was made. Well, the bottom line is, I mean, look, it's obviously the vote can be the vote, let's just move on. I mean, I, I've got, I do have, I, that, that ain't, I'm, I feel good now. Uh, so I have, I've got my questions <laughs> answered, and I'm covered. I don't want to continue to hold it up. But. Well, the comment was made that this is for a pandemic only, but I've read the first paragraph about six or seven times now. It does not define that this is for a pandemic only. It states an emergency. It gives an example of the pandemic of 2020-2021, and this was voted on by many districts last year, including ours, but it does not specify that this is a pandemic only response. It says any emergency as deemed necessary by the school district. It's a cold water. Yeah, but then if you look at the second section, it says the LEA will elect to implement temperatures in response to the COVID-19 global. So the language in school code doesn't mention global pandemic because it's the school code of 1949. It was actually a, a disease. So the, the citation, the language does not mention. So section 520.1, which is the section they're using, doesn't mention global pandemic. But if you look at the second section, it says 
in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic may. So the first paragraph is the citation for the law, the second paragraph is telling you when you may use that. Not how I read it, it's not clear. Um, so to be perfect sure though, please, if everyone had their um, questions. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. I have an okay. Thank you. Moving on. Yes. Uh, moving on. Um, I think Mr. Reese, you're all done. Um, for E, the first reading of revised policy. Uh, motion to approve the first reading of revised policy 246 student wellness. Thank you. Can I have a second? Can I have a second? Uh, any questions? Is 
And this is our first reading, so we do have an um, opportunity to see this again with revisions, correct? Yes. With that, we can take a substantive change because we can revise things that aren't substantive changes, but is there a point in moving on if there's a substantive change that the board has consensus that it would like to support? And I'm just not sure what a substantive change to a policy is. We would have to, there's no point in voting for this if we're all in favor of looking at that language and that language that says a substantive change. So would we like to table this? Well, we're considering it with substantive change, so. Um, okay. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Abbey, you have to let me know, are we following the procedure? We will be tabling this, or we are not voting since there's substantive change. I think you can table this and bring it up at okay. the when we look to see changes to the current year. Okay. Do I need a motion to table this? Do I need a motion to table this? Yeah. I thought you were asking for a motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's next. I was waiting for you to say yeah. May I have a motion to table the first reading, please? And um, all those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Moving on to special education. Second. You can just say um, is um, we have two contracts here. If you would like, is there any information that you'd like to well to share? Um, the first contract is um, a contract for a student. It's an annual contract for a student in our district. Can I have a motion to approve the contract, please? Second. Uh, any questions? All those in favor? Extension. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 6B, the Karen Foundation Agreement. Yes, the Karen Foundation Agreement is one of our community partnerships um, where they provide additional support and services for our students for 22 and four and three quarter hours per week, where they service the high school, middle school, and Relates to um, the Lehigh Valley Health Network one-to-one uh, -one service offering that we have offered our students as well, but this is your twenty to twenty-two service. Thank you. And it'll be used through um, Metro Funding. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the Karen Foundation Agreement, please? Second. Are there any other further questions for the second? Obviously, 
the number of students that were receiving these grants was 57, and there were a variety of programs that seemed to be of most need, um, such as anxiety, mental health concerns, and substance abuse and family issues. So three population of those students were receiving grants. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstentions? Okay. Moving on to eight, business and finance. Um, is there an objection if I take eight A through E together? May I have a motion, please? Second? Second. Um, any questions on those? What's the almost eighty-four thousand dollars that went to C D W seven? On the bill so so under the bill of approval. Sure. So for the project program that we purchased through the asset fund. Okay. And then the G H A technologies for three hundred and fifty six thousand dollars? Sure. So it's been the camera system upgrades that okay. we talked about also through asset fund. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstentions? Thank you. Uh, 8F. So we have um, the administration or ask for listening to A, the final adoption of the budget. Any motion? Second? Second. And now, um, Ms. Shaw, do you have anything that you'd like to share with us? Um, there are no changes to our administration. Okay. Any questions? All those in favor? Oh, I think we have to do a roll call vote. I'm sorry, yes, we have to do a roll call vote for this. Okay. All those in favor? Ms. Fuller, if you'll. Yep. No. Yep. Yes. Um, Revenue observed. Do I need to move the I'm sorry, I have a motion to vote. I was looking at the staff testimony. Yeah, I can do that. Another motion or another roll call? Just another roll call? Okay, I do need a motion. So to levy is an old please. I have a motion. A second. Second. Any questions? Um, all those in favor. Oh, sorry. Roll call. No. Yes. Yes. Okay, and then um, a motion for levying the various act 511 taxes. May I have a motion, please? Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Oh, again, sorry. <laughs> a roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Moving on to 8G appro approval of Homestead Farms Bank Resolution. Motion to approve the attached Homestead Farms Bank Resolution. May I have a motion? Second. 
questions or any information to share in the chat? No. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And abstentions. Thank you. Nine. Uh, if anyone opposed, if I take nine A through C together, these are um, contracts that are yearly contracts for us. Any, may I have a motion? A second. Second. And uh, any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And abstentions. On to number 10, human resources. 10, anyone opposed if I take 10A through C together? Did you, I'm sorry, what did you say, Mr. Oh. May I have a motion, please? Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? Okay, thank you. Um, under 11, other business. Um, nothing under 12, communication. Under number 13, new business. Uh, 14 for um, information only. Board reports, as always, take a look at the board reports for um, the information. Uh, yep, Mr. Bindi. I just, uh, I assume they are referring to the board uh, hearing this next month. It's still unclear whether they're on the plan, and that's the compensation plan. Moving forward for the health and safety plan? Right. So my understanding is that um, we have, and Ms. Ruth or Ms. Beckett can, can um, you know, we are going to be working, that's always working, we're always working on it, and they will be working on it to, I swear it's going to be new plan brought up to uh, the next board meeting, so based on feedback from today. Tomorrow, the communication will go out to you, we see the feedback from the survey. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We do. So we'll have an option on June 28th to vote on the board meeting. We'll have a board meeting. Thank you. 